It's all too easy to think of Owen Hart's story as a tragedy, that of a young man whose life was taken too soon, but in many ways that would be doing him a disservice, because by all accounts he was someone who was full of life. A devoted father and husband, the likes of which are rarely seen in the wrestling industry, as well as a friend to everyone he worked with, so beloved was he that you won't find anyone who had a bad word to say about him. And that's not even mentioning the skill he had as a wrestler, yes, Owen Hart was truly ahead of his time. A great in-ring performer who could wrestle in multiple styles, as well as one of the greatest mic workers the industry has ever seen. So join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in King of Hearts, The Owen Hart Story. Owen James Hart was born on May 7, 1965 in Calgary, Alberta, Canada into the legendary Hart family. And as the youngest child of 12, Owen quickly became the blue-eyed boy to his parents, the one who could of course do no wrong, something which may account for the good nature he would later become famous for. And growing up with 11 siblings probably explains his notorious prankster behavior too, this being something he would learn growing up in the Hart family compound as he became known for the jokes he would play on his older brothers and sisters. One thing he wasn't able to join them in doing though, at least not at first, was training to become a wrestler. No, as the runt of the litter, Owen would have to stand back and watch the likes of Brett, Bruce and Keith learn the ropes while he patiently waited for his own turn. A turn that would end up coming while in high school as he finally convinced his father Stu to start teaching him in the infamous Hart Family Dungeon, the place where men were made and many others were broken. Of course, as a Hart, there was little doubt that the youngster would be able to survive the ordeal and pretty soon he was showing himself to be something of an in-ring prodigy. Someone who had a noticeable amount of natural talent even when taking his family lineage into account. And part of that family lineage was of course Stampede Wrestling, the promotion that his father owned and the premier wrestling spot in all of Canada. With this avenue opened up to him then, Owen began working for the company in 1983 while also doing shots over in England for ITV's World of Sport. And even in these early days, he was considered something of a groundbreaker, using a high-flying offense that had rarely been seen at this point and was far different to that of the more mat-based styles of his siblings. Of course, that wasn't to say he wasn't highly adept at this style too, it's just that his Dynamite Kid-esque theatrics were what really helped him to stand out amongst his already crowded family. But that said, despite his natural aptitude for the ring and his innovative abilities, wrestling wasn't always something the youngest Hart considered to be a long-term prospect for him. No, by this point, he'd already met the love of his life, Martha, marrying the year prior, and deciding then that the lifestyle required to be in the industry was not something he wanted to subject her to. At one point, he'd even tried out different career paths, but when none of those worked, he returned to wrestling promising himself that he would save every penny he made so he could retire at a young age, this giving him more time to spend with his wife and the family they planned to have. In the meantime though, he would continue to rise up the ranks of the wrestling world, and by 1986 would even win the Stampede Wrestling International Tag Team titles with Ben Bassarab, this success being part of the reason he was named Pro Wrestling Illustrated's Rookie of the Year in 1987. And 87 would turn out to be another banner one for Owen because it would be then that he would have a feud with the Dynamite Kid, all while simultaneously branching out east as he performed tours for New Japan Pro Wrestling, at one point even winning their prestigious IWGP Junior Heavyweight title, becoming the first ever non-Japanese wrestler to do so in the process. After that it was only a matter of time until Vince McMahon came calling and this eventually happened in the summer of 1988 when, as part of the working relationship McMahon had with Stu Hart, Owen was brought over for a tryout and soon after that signed up to a contract once the boss saw what he could do. At this time though, instead of promoting the youngest Hart child as the brother of Brett, who was already on the roster by then, WWE gave Owen a different gimmick, that of a masked superhero-like character initially called the Blue Angel and then later renamed the Blue Blazer. The idea then was to capitalize on the high-flying style he was so innovatively using, something which worked during his early appearances as the youngster quickly got over with fans after he defeated a number of lower card acts like Steve Lombardi, Barry Horowitz and Terry Gibbs. There was even some internal talk amongst officials at the time that it was in fact Owen and not Brett who was the real one to watch, 
and with the support behind the scenes, it didn't take long for him to start making it to the big shows. His first pay-per-view appearance coming at that year's Survivor Series when he was a part of a winning team of babyfaces. After that, he continued to work in the company's lower mid-card, but after feeling like he was beginning to stall, he temporarily left WWE, going back to work for both Stampede and New Japan instead, while also making appearances in Mexico and Germany as he further broadened his horizons. And by 1991, it seemed like he was ready to return to the big-time stateside, though this would initially come in the form of a cup of coffee in World Championship Wrestling. But while here, he would find himself stuck in the same spot he had originally been in with WWE. So instead of remaining with Ted Turner's company then, he instead took up McMahon on another offer and rejoined the New York promotion later that year, this time being teamed up with his real-life brother-in-law and former partner of Brett, Jim the Anvil Neidhart, as they became known as the New Foundation. Of course, wrestling fans will be well aware that anytime you add a new suffix to a pre-existing team name, it rarely, if ever, works out. And while the new foundation will never make anyone's list of great teams, it did give Owen a chance to get a more prominent spot on the card and thus show off his talents to a wider audience. And this audience, particularly the younger amongst them, fell in love with the now unmasked Calgary native pretty quickly. In particular, he became popular not just for his in-ring skill, but for being a relatively small wrestler in what was, at the time, the land of the giants, someone who proved you could still be a star even if you weren't six foot four. In fact, many future stars would watch Owen at this point and begin idolizing him. Some notable examples of this include Chris Jericho, who based much of his style on the youngest heart, and Kevin Owens, who not only took his ring name from him, but even later named his own son, Owen, after him. And all this adoration was certainly warranted based on what the Calgary boy was doing in the ring, as he and the Anvil got into a feud with the Beverly Brothers, this leading to a clash between the two teams at the 1992 Royal Rumble. After that, Neidhart left the company, and this gave Owen an opportunity to go on a brief run as a single star, this run even seeing him get a big victory over Skinner at WrestleMania 8 on April 5th of that year. By the summer, though, he had returned to the tag team division after he began aligning himself with Coco Beware, the two forming the duo High Energy that, while very good in the ring, are more commonly remembered now for having some of the worst ring gear known to man, a mid-90s hellscape of racetrack squares and Saved by the Bell tier garish colors. Still, Owen wasn't too phased by this, and he made it work as best he could. At this point, he was also becoming well-known for his backstage pranks, many of which have since become legendary. Some of the best of these would include him sending a truck full of pigs to Vince McMahon's office, where they would do their business before being discovered, secretly dumping three bottles of hot sauce into Harley Race's chili, and trying to get Steve Austin to break character in front of a house show crowd by selling attacks with a bag of popcorn like he'd been shot. Yes, for as much as he was loved on screen, he was twice as loved behind the scenes, with everyone who worked for the company unanimously agreeing that the youngest of the hearts was one of the most genuine and nicest people in the industry. In fact, while many of his peers were going out after shows to drink heavily and take a cocktail of drugs as to deal with the constant pain they were in, Owen was more likely to be found either in his hotel room on the phone to his wife or racing home to see his kids before heading back out to the next town. And of course, all of this was also being done so that he could save his money as much as possible, still with the intention of retiring in his mid-30s. That was why Owen felt it important for him to rise up the card as far as possible then, as he knew his time to make this cash would be limited. And with that in mind, he must have been overjoyed when in 1993, he began getting involved in the ongoing Bret Hart and Jerry Lawler program, siding with his brother as the two took the fight to the king, even going as far as to go to his home turf, the United States Wrestling Association, and challenge him there. In fact, during his stint there, Owen would even win the USWA Unified World Heavyweight title. However, any lengthy run with this belt had to be cut short when he suffered a knee injury that summer, this taking him out of action for the next couple of months. When he did return in the autumn, the Hart Lawler feud had been temporarily sidetracked. That said though, the brothers did continue to team together, both being part of a Survivor Series elimination match at that November's titular show, fighting alongside their other siblings Bruce and Keith. 
It was during that match, however, that the beginnings of a feud between the two would start to present itself, as Owen, who was the only member of his team eliminated that night, began acting increasingly jealous towards his brother, seemingly resenting of all his success. Of course, the sibling rivalry is an easy one to connect with, but initially, Vince McMahon was not sold on the idea, with him believing that brothers simply don't fight. It took some convincing from Brett then for the whole thing to go ahead, and even more convincing after that to have it be Owen and not Bruce Hart as the boss had originally wanted, playing the heel in the situation. After things were set in motion though, the two would continue to team, albeit with the unease between them growing in the months that followed. At one point, Owen, desperate to prove that he was better than his brother, even challenged Brett to a fight. However, the excellence of execution would flat out refuse this, instead wanting only to work out their issues in a civil manner. It all eventually came to a head at the January 22, 1994 Royal Rumble where, during a tag team title match against the Quebecers, Brett would suffer a kayfabe knee injury. Despite this though, he would consistently refuse to tag out and let his brother take over, this ending up leading to the referee calling a stoppage once he was too hurt to continue. After the match then, a frustrated Owen, furious with his brother for not trusting him enough to tag him in, turned on him, kicking his leg out of his leg as he from there became one of the most hated heels in the company. From there, he demanded that his brother face him one on one, and after months of refusing, Brett eventually relented and allowed him his match at WrestleMania 10, where the two would open the show, giving fans one of the greatest wrestling contests ever seen inside a WWE ring at that point. And what made it even better for the runt of the heart litter was that he would be the one to get the victory come the end of it, catching the hitman with a roll-up after just 20 minutes. This victory would only be fleeting as it turned out, however, because by the end of the night, Brett would have beaten Yokozuna to win the WWE title, once again stealing the spotlight from Owen. And jealousy was something you could clearly see etched across the younger heart's face as he watched the new champion from the aisle way at the close of the show furious at the turn of events, but still satisfied with the knowledge that his earlier victory surely now placed him first in line for a title shot. Of course, that title shot would come, but before it did, Owen would further prove that he could be just as good as his brother when he won the 1994 King of the Ring, the same tournament Brett had won the year prior, as he from then on started proclaiming himself to be the King of Hearts. After that, he challenged the champion to a steel cage match at that August SummerSlam, a match which many believe is even better than their first bout and was only the second ever WWE contest to be awarded 5 stars in Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Now, whether you prefer the expert psychology of the cage match or the technical wizardry of the WrestleMania showdown is up to your personal preference, but either way, both of them stand as masterpieces, and despite him ultimately not winning the title at the end of the second bout, it proved that Owen could be a real main event player when given the opportunity. Clearly, Vince McMahon must have understood this as well, because he even gave Owen a phantom title win around this time too something which was never officially recognized as the decision was overturned after the match. And after being unable to officially wrangle the belt from his brother, he was ultimately able to get the better of him when he threw in the towel during Brett's submission match against Bob Backlund at that November Survivor Series, screwing him out of the gold even if he wasn't able to win it himself. And from there, now content that he had got one over on his older sibling, Owen began moving on to new things, namely teaming with Yokozuna to win the WWE Tag Team titles from the Smoking Guns at WrestleMania 11, following this up by successfully defending them on multiple occasions while also joining the Camp Cornette stable that would later include his brother-in-law, the British Bulldog, as well. Over time, Owen and the Bulldog would pretty much become an exclusive team, in fact, with them even winning the tag team titles themselves at September 22, 1996's In Your House Mind Games, around about the same time that the King of Hearts was starting to bring his newly won Slammy Awards to the ring with him everywhere he went, upping the obnoxiousness at every turn in some of the funniest moments in WWE history. In fact, Owen stealing a Slammy at the 1997 award ceremony itself may very well go down as the greatest piece of comedy the wrestling business has ever produced. And while this was happening, his personal life continued to boom too, as his daughter Athena was born. But as they say, nothing good can last forever, 
And so, as the year went on, the tag team champions began to show signs of dissension, something that would continue to bubble as they had a hugely underrated match to determine the inaugural WWE European Champion in February of 1997 at a show in Germany, a match which Owen would ultimately lose. It seemed then like the family members were going to implode. Luckily, however, this stopped when a newly heel, or at least heel in America, Bret Hart convinced them to stop fighting and join him instead as he reformed the Hart Foundation. And together again, The Stable, which also included Jim Neidhart and Brian Pillman, would see them all be revitalized as they waged war on their US counterparts throughout the rest of the year, acting as either heels or babyfaces, depending on the country they were in. This story also led to Owen winning the Intercontinental title from a young Rocky Maivia, a title he would then later defend against Stone Cold Steve Austin at that August SummerSlam, a match most famous now for it being the one in which a botched pile driver from the Canadian led to the rattlesnake breaking his neck and almost being paralyzed. Following this, Owen would use the injury to gain heel heat as part of a storyline, and then, when the time came, would drop the IC belt back to Stone Cold upon his return in November. And this, as it happened, would also be the same night of the Montreal Screwjob, the night that saw every other member of the Hart family quit the company in disgust. All except for Owen, that was, who Vince McMahon refused to let out of his contract, still seeing plenty of value in him despite the tense situation. Obviously, Owen was unhappy about this, but in his mind, he was already preparing for retirement anyway, and so decided that he would run out his contract before leaving the wrestling industry to be with his family as planned. And over the next couple of years, that's just what he did, largely working in the mid-card as he feuded with the likes of Triple H and the rest of D-Generation X, all while becoming the newest member of the Nation of Domination, his position in the primarily African-American stable being tenuously explained as him being the Black Heart of the Heart Clan. After that, he joined forces with Jeff Jarrett, a story that was meant to see him attempt to steal Jarrett's valet Deborah away from him but one which he ended up vetoing, as the notorious family man didn't want his children to see him doing a romance angle on TV with another woman. Maybe it was turning this down then that left him feeling like he had to accept it when the company chose to revive the old Blue Blazer character in early 1999, with the gimmick this time being portrayed as a hapless comedy superhero wannabe who consistently made a fool of himself. That was certainly the plan on May 23rd of that year. When at the Over the Edge pay-per-view in Kansas City, he was scheduled to rappel down from the ceiling, only for the harness to get stuck a few feet from the ground, forcing Owen to awkwardly free himself. Of course, that's not what happened that night, as instead the harness came loose while Owen was still 78 feet in the air, causing him to fall, crashing down to the ring below. While this was happening, the house lights were down as a promo package was playing on the Titantron, so a few saw it clearly in the moment. When the show returned from this package, however, it was obvious that something was very wrong as the cameras remained on a solemn Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler, who explained that a terrible accident had happened and that this was most certainly not part of the show. From there, paramedics took Owen from the ring into a waiting ambulance, but by this point it was already too late. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital at just 34 years old. In the end, it appeared that an incorrect release trigger was the cause of the accident, with the trigger being unsuitable to hold a 227-pound man so high up in the air. The following night, WWE dedicated that edition of Raw to Owen, rewriting the show to be a two-hour-long tribute to him. From there, Owen's wife Martha would disconnect herself from the wrestling business entirely, requesting that the company remove Owen's likeness from being used again on WWE programming, as well as not wanting Owen to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Martha would instead memorialize Owen by starting up the Owen Hart Foundation, an organization that provides opportunity to people with limited resources, meaning that Owen's name will forever be associated with helping others, something that we know the notoriously kind man would have been proud of. Ultimately though, the death and subsequent fallout should not be what defines Owen Hart's legacy. No, it should not only be the talent he showed in the ring, but the love he gathered from everyone he met. The wrestling industry can often be a place full of shady characters, and so, it is nigh on impossible for there to be someone who everyone universally agrees was a truly good man, utterly devoted to his family and caring towards his friends before everything else. Yes, Owen will forever go down as one of the most entertaining figures in the history of professional wrestling, truly one of the greatest performers in every sense of the word, 
and for that reason, the King of Hearts will live on in our hearts forever. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.